Okay, so last video we were talking about how did the Europeans begin to get more involved in trading in Africa and talking about the slave trade. Today we're going to talk about, still talking about why did the Europeans become more involved in Africa, but today we're going to focus on North Africa. Because when we were talking about the slave trade, we were primarily talking about West Africa. So today we're going to talk about why did the Europeans push for a stronger influence in North Africa. And the building is still going on in my house since I'm recording this video five minutes after I recorded the other video. So you're still going to hear lots of strange noises from my house. So just bear with it. Um, so as far as North Africa goes, Egypt. Now, Egypt had a lot of experience in state building. Egypt had a lot of contact with Europe throughout the centuries, um, being right on the Mediterranean coast. Um, and it was a model of nationalism, but it still is going to be taken over. Now, during this point in history, the controller of Egypt would be the Ottoman Empire. But the Ottoman Empire um, is kind of a crumbling empire. Some would call it the sick man of Europe. It's losing control over its outer provinces, and nationalism was growing um, in Europe. Now, uh, in Egypt, excuse me. Now, if you look at this picture, and you might pick up on the fact that we have the pyramids in the background, but then we have a French flag, because Napoleon invades Egypt in 1798 during the course of the Napoleonic Wars. And that's also when you might remember, I remember hearing last year about the Rosetta Stone. That's, it's Napoleon's troops that find the Rosetta Stone, which allows linguists to be able to break the code and be able to read ancient hieroglyphics. So Napoleon invades Egypt in 1798 and then is pushed out by Egyptians, Ottomans, and British in 1801. Um, two years later, the British withdrew their forces. Um, now... The leader for the Ottomans that was very prominent in helping to push the French out of um, Egypt was this man here. His name was Muhammad Ali. Not the fighter, um, but he was Muhammad Ali. And he was actually um, not even Egyptian. He was from Albania, but he was the leader of the Albanian cavalry that was sent in by the Ottoman Empire, because the Albanians were controlled by the Ottomans as well, sent in by the Ottoman Sultan to help push the French out of Egypt. And so basically he took over rule of Egypt and nominally was still a viceroy of the Ottoman Empire. So he's ruling Egypt. It's still technically part of the Ottoman Empire, but he has a lot of power there. Now, what he did, though, is he instituted a series of reforms for Egypt. He introduced new industries, and in particular concentrated on the cultivation of cotton as a cash crop. Now, if you ever heard of Egyptian cotton, you'll know that it's considered a very high-quality cotton, and it's considered very, very expensive. Um, but what he did is he concentrated on the cultivation of cotton as a cash crop, and because Egypt is warm, you were able to have year-round cultivation. But because Egypt is also desert, this was dependent on extensive irrigation. He also encouraged the, the development of textile mills. Now, this economic modernization was led by the state rather than private business owners. But he also streamlined the government administration. He built a secular state school to train administrative officers for the government and training students in Western scholarship. Now... Also, Muhammad Ali modernized the army, and he actually captured the country of Sudan, which is south of Egypt, and established a capital there in 1830. He also then went to the Middle East. He gained control of Mecca and Medina. And he was very secular in, out in outlook. You would say he was more of a more moderate Muslim. He was succeeded by his son, I didn't mean to move that. I like what I was writing. Darn it. Okay, so he was succeeded by his son, Ishmael. Now, his son, Ishmael, did something really significant, and that was commissioning the building of the Suez Canal. So he commissioned a French firm to build the Suez Canal, and this canal opened in 1869. Um, 
Now, this was huge for Egypt and for Europe because it is a massive shortcut, especially for Britain, to a place like India because now you don't have to go all the way around the continent of Africa. Now, modernization in Egypt brought very mixed results. They entered into the international economy, but they spent more on imports and they spent more on military modernization and they really weren't developing their economy. They were focused on something, and for those of you that took APHG next, last year, excuse me, you might know this word, their economy was focused very much on what we would call monoculture, which is the specializing in a single crop for export, that being cotton. Now, the issue with cotton is cotton is very, like I said before, requires extensive irrigation, but also is very draining of the soil's nutrients. So it's also very harsh on the soil. This left Egypt very vulnerable to the instability of price fluctuations for cotton. As a result, their debts began to become higher and the creditors pressured the government to force, now this word here, the Khedive, that's what the rulers, um, that's what Ali, Muhammad Ali and Ishmael and his successors were called. They forced the Khedive to appoint European experts as commissioners of debt, starting in 1876. Um, and then, in 1878, the Khedive was forced to add French and British representatives to their cabinets. And then, in 1881, they pressured the Ottoman Sultan to dismiss the Khedive. So what you're basically seeing is the Europeans are gaining more and more power and influence in the Egyptian government, especially because they're interested in the Suez Canal. If you remember in class, some of you read um, the British band aid system in Egypt, and Britain took the attitude that, oh, the Egyptians don't know how to govern themselves, so they need us, the British, to train them and teach them how to govern, and then once they're able to govern, then we can let them. Um, you know, govern themselves. Now, the Egyptian military instituted a revolt against these changes in the Egyptian government. The British sent in forces, in particular to protect the Suez Canal, and the British are going to stay in Egypt as the power behind the throne in Egypt until the 1950s, when there is eventually a military coup um, and the Egyptians actually take power for themselves. Now, when you talk about North Africa in general, and not just Egypt, you can't talk about it without relation to the Ottoman Empire because it's the Ottoman Empire that's controlling this whole area. But like I said before, the Ottoman Empire is really considered to be the sick man of Europe. It's a declining empire. So this created a lot of opportunity, and particularly for the French. The French were very interested in North Africa because here's France, and here's North Africa, very, very close by, just across the Mediterranean. Um, also, when you're dealing with the northern coast of North Africa, you have a Mediterranean climate very similar to Spain and, s and the south of France. So these areas were nominally under Ottoman rule. There was a lot of piracy going on. And so that's how the French kind of got themselves involved because there's all sorts of little pirate ships sailing across this area. Actually, our first involvement in um, war was under President uh, Jefferson and it was against the Barbary pirates in this region as well. So basically in 1830, the France, the French, excuse me, began um, to attack the pirates. They took on this campaign that they're going to get rid of the pirates in the Mediterranean, which were mostly coming out of Algeria. Um, and basically Algeria was a politically fragmented area and um, the French were able to eventually come in and take over. And the way that they did it is um, in 1841, a war broke out between the French um, and Abid um, Qadir, who was the head of an important Muslim brotherhood. Um, and resistance was growing under him to kind of create their own army. They had an army of about 10,000. 
So a war breaks out in 1841 between the French and al Qadir's forces. Um, the French sent 110,000 troops, which was a third of their total army. They also attacked Morocco in addition to Algiers. Um, basically, the French are going to destroy the crops of al Qadir's army. Some say the Algerian casualties in this battle or in this fight between the French and the Algerians was as high as one-third of the population. The French armies began seizing land and opening it up for French occupation and settlement. So Algeria is going to become what we consider to be a settler colony for the French, meaning that many tens of thousands of Europeans, most of them French, went to Algeria looking for opportunity and looking for land. Um, even though not all the Europeans were French, they did adopt French language and French culture. By the 1850s, you have 130,000 French living in Algeria. By 1900, it's more than half a million, and it's 13% of the population. Now, the Europeans that came and settled in Algeria were considered citizens of France. The Muslims who were from that area, of, from Algeria themselves, they were considered legal subjects. They did not have the same rights as the citizens. In 1870, Algeria is formally annexed by the French. French citizens had the right to vote for members of the National Assembly, but subjects did not have that voting rights. The best land was given to the French, and the Algerians were left with small, marginal lands to grow crops. Um, and then the French also began to capture parts of West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, another thing that's just kind of significant with what's been going on in the news today lately is that most of the Muslims living in France today are of Algerian descent, and one of the major issues that France has with its Algerian community living in France, oh, and also, by the way, French Algerians, so people who were French but living in Algeria, when they came back to France, they were not accepted as Frenchmen. They were seen as Algerians. That's a whole other story. But those French, those Algerian Muslims that came and settled in France after France gave Algeria its independence, some of those people have been in France living there for two or three generations. So now they're born in France, or maybe even their parents are born in France but they've still never been fully accepted by the French. Uh, they are on the marginal outskirts of society. They live in these large slums on the outsides of Paris, and they're really not given equal job opportunities, and they're kind of seen as outsiders within French society, which is one of the reasons why there are tensions in France today between the Muslim community of France and uh, the rest of the population of France. Um, so this is what we're going to leave off for today. The last topic I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about South Africa, and that'll be our third video for the African imperialism topic.